All right, well, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Bobby Kirkhart. Um, I've had the very strong pleasure of working with Bobby for like a decade now or a something. Whole decade. Well, it seems like a long time to me. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, and uh, I've had all sorts of wonderful, wonderful interactions with Bobby, uh, especially working, well, actually working at both the national and the local level. Um, Bobby has been the president of Atheist Alliance International um, and uh, worked with her in that capacity, um, but also uh, she was the vice president, the founding vice president uh, of the Secular Coalition for America uh, for many, many years. Uh, and uh, I uh, enjoyed working with taking that organization from just an idea uh, to, um, to one that has uh, not just a lobbyist, but a whole lobby shop in Washington, D.C. now. Um, and Bobby has also been very, very involved in Atheists United here in Los Angeles, uh, which is one of, if not the largest local atheist group in the country. Um, and I'm sure she can talk about that if you're interested in talking about that. Um, but uh, today she's going to talk about this awesome finger torture thing, uh, which you've all been issued. Uh, and with that, please join me in welcoming Bobby Kirkhart. I may need your help here. Uh, thank you, thank you. I uh, thought I'd be the only person to hand out toys today, but Susie uh, <laughs> not only gave you toys, but all kinds of great goodies. Uh, uh, we used to do this when I was a kid, and I think about it, every time I'm kind of cornered by a true believer. You, you get this where they, they, they come up and they've got these, they, they're going to convert you. And, Every time you make a wonderful, strong point, you put, put your fingers in like this. I, you guys had video games. We had straw toys. <laughs> <laughs> you put your fingers in, and then you try to pull them apart. And the stronger you pull, the tighter it gets. So that is, in my mind, very much like a lot of religious atheist discussions and debates. And that's because we're trying to, to debate facts and reason and logic, and that, that's not what's, what's important to them. And what's important to them is, first of all, they've made a commitment to religion. Now, commitments in themselves aren't all that strong. How many people in this room are now atheists who have once made a commitment to religion? Most of the room didn't hold, huh? So cr commitments need to be propped up. And there are some props that, uh, that you're well aware of. The social pressure, uh, families love, sometimes families censure. These things don't get into our discussions with religionists. What get into our discussions with religionists are the two props of need and guilt. Religionists, Christians especially really believe they need their religion. Uh, maybe it's a little like an addict who believes he needs his drugs. And maybe they're right. In some cases, I'm sure they're right. Religion is a coping device, and for some people, it may be the best available. But for most people, it's a little like the old joke about the guy that goes into the psychiatrist's office. The psychiatrist says, sir, why are you snapping your fingers all the time? And the guy says, keep the, keep the tigers away. Well, sir, there are not a, not a tiger within 100 miles of here. See, it works. <laughs> so that's, that's the need. They feel the need. And they feel the guilt. If they belong to a religion, I won't name a specific religion, but a religion that says you were born with original sin, you're not going to escape guilt if your religion not only has a lot of, of taboos of sexual activity, but says if you lust in your heart, you have sinned, you have a lot of guilt. And the one that is very important to us is 
if you doubt your God, if you don't believe in your God, you have sinned. If you judge God, this was, I was very religious uh, into early adulthood, and this was a big problem when I was in high school and college, was that uh, I, I believed in God, I loved God, but I knew that God was evil. And uh, when we argue our points, the reasons we are atheists, the reasons we decided to buck the social tradition and look for truth, we activate these props on their commitment, and we make their commitment stronger. Have you ever noticed that it's the churches who are always wanting to set up debates? Well, there are reasons for that. We'll get into a little later. But for now, let's talk about some of the things that we try to tell religionists, things we know that they don't. First of all, the process of evolution. Now, a lot of the Christians you know, and certainly other religionists, believe in evolution. But unless they're scientists, they chances are don't know much about the process of it. They don't really understand how we got from a single-celled animal to August. <laughs> <laughs> and it does seem rather amazing. It is entirely consistent with the idea that somebody wanted an August. Well, Amanda wanted an August. Maybe she's God. Um, so, and they don't understand the anthropology of the Middle East. Now, my guess is most of us don't know a lot about it either, but we know a little bit. We know something about the relationship of the various tribes. We know something about the shared and borrowed mythologies. They don't know anything about ancient religions. They don't know about other savior gods that died and resurrected and saved their people. They don't know how many gods were born on Christmas. They, they don't know about this stuff. Th this is an important one. If there's actually a fact that that it's often valuable to share with religionists. It's probably this one. When the Bible was written, most of them believe, especially the New Testament, they think Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written by people named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John who were disciples of Jesus, and they sat down and wrote it all right after he ascended into heaven. Well, the very earliest of the Gospels might have been written as early as 70 CPE. Probably not that early, but certainly at least 40 years after Jesus, if he existed, had died. They don't know that. This is an interesting one. If one religionist is right after you, they don't know their own religion. They don't know their own church, their own church doctrines. And they don't know the conte contemporary religions other than their own. They, they may have a superficial acquaintance. They may know something about the more colorful rituals. Uh, they may know one or two lines of philosophy, but they don't, they don't know much about contemporary religions. And for, for this country, other than, uh, than Ju Judaism, they tend to think, and, and Islam now, they tend to think people who have other religions don't really believe those religions. I mean, this is in the literature. You can find this in the literature, that people who, who, are, who have other religions are not, are not sincere, that, that Christians are sincere. So they don't, they, they don't know these things, and we do. But there are some things they know that we don't. Oh, I clicked two at once. Uh, and the first is none of all that is important. They don't care about that. That's not, that's not part of their need, guilt, social support, family love syndrome that keeps them religious. Second prayer is effective. Evan got into that. Uh, any, any sports fan, any sports fan knows 
that the, the need to have power over something remote, something you can't control. You yell at the TV, right? He's going to come low and outside, get ready. Yeah, yeah. It's prayer. <laughs> if somebody told you you couldn't do that, shouldn't do that, you'd be very upset. As a matter of fact, if you're in the stands, they, uh, oh, it was, that, it was that tenth man in the stands that helped us win the series, right? Yeah. Prayer is effective. It doesn't get the kinds of tangible results, like, you know, it doesn't clean up oil spills or heal sick people, but it is a very effective coping device. And one thing they know that is probably true of us, too, in our attitudes more often than we'd like to admit, truth and fact have a very loose relationship. Uh, they're always uh, interested in the, the deeper truth, which, which may have nothing whatsoever to do with the facts. Okay. Now, there are some things they know that we don't know they know. One is they know virgins don't have babies. They know snakes don't talk. They know that people don't rise from the dead, turn into stone or salt or climb ladders to heaven. They know this. Now, they have two ways of dealing with it. The fundamentalist way is like the wife whose husband is cheating. Everybody knows he's cheating, and she denies it. I know it looks bad, but he's a salesman. You've got to take that meeting in context. You, you've got to interpret what he was doing. He was making a sale. And the liberal religionists are like the wife whose husband is cheating and everybody knows it and she decides it's not important. Yeah, I know, you know, when he's, when he's on the road, he has his fun, but, you know, he always comes back to me. Right? It's not important. It's not important what the Bible says. But it's the holy book. So, wanted to talk a little about why they need to convert us. And I'll talk uh, first about, you know what doomsday cults are? These people who some leader says, on March 7th, Jesus is going to come to the top of Mount Baldy. And everybody who's waiting there, true believers who wait there in our underwear at 7.46 a.m. will be taken into heaven. These cults fascinate sociologists, but they're very closed groups. Sociologists can't get into them very rarely. They are very tight-knit, closed groups until, guess what, 7.46 a.m., at the top of Mount Baldy, Jesus doesn't come. <laughs> what a shock. You and I might think, oh, well, you go home and you refigure the situation. <laughs> but they've, they've made this commitment, and they've made this a tremendous investment in their commitment. So what they do is become evangelical, lacking this physical proof that they needed they want social proof. Now, we all, we all look for social proof. We talk about how uncomfortable it is to be the only atheist in a group. Uh, probably when you were in middle school, at some time you did this thing about standing on the corner and looking up to see how many people who would come look up. <laughs> yeah. And if you're in that group and somebody comes along and says, hey, what's up there? You don't see anything. You don't tell them nothing. You say, I can't tell. I don't know. We have social proof that something is up there. So, <clears throat> trying to argue with them, trying to debate with them is useless. Well, there are only two possible reasons then for the fact we have, what, 40 people in this room maybe? Uh, Tomorrow morning, maybe 50, we'll hear Daryl Ray. And, oh, how many 10-mile uh, radius, how many people will be in churches at the same time? 
Now, there, there, there's got to be a reason for that. It's either that they're a lot better at organizing than we are, or that there is a God. <laughs> I think they're better at organizing, and I, <laughs> and I think they have some tools we don't. But we do have some tools. What can you do? First of all, something they do that we don't do a lot is witness. You have a religious friend? Oh. Our church group had so much fun the other night. Right? You hear all the time about their church activities. You don't talk about the secular student activities because that just makes people mad. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, this is your life. They can accept it. Table. Most of you do this, I think. Most student groups, college campuses have wonderful opportunities for table. Never tabling. Never miss one. I'm not big on the standing there handing out flyer things. Uh, if you don't have a table, you're much too vulnerable to the argument and such. And th there are times for it. There are situations for it. But try to have a table. Try to have a physical place. Represent. When there is a student activity, when student organizations are getting together, be sure that someone from your secular student group is there. Because someone from the Baptist Student Union is there. Someone from the Lutheran students are there, which is good. You're not there to fight them. You're there to represent yourself. How you should do it. First of all, invite. How many times do you get invited to church in your freshman year of college? And nobody says, oh, you've got to come hear our minister and be saved. They say, we're going to have a great barbecue and you'll meet a lot of good looking guys there. And, you know, right? Yeah. So be sure that your student group has some activities that it's comfortable to invite believers to so that you're a part of the campus. Oh, we're going to show the movie Creation tomorrow night. You'll like that movie. You're a biology major. Come with me. And then when they get there, don't harangue them about, you know there is no God. Enjoy the movie. Qualify. When you talk to them, talk in I messages. Well, I see it this way. Or, or at, at attribute. Uh, well, you know, uh, Stephen Hawking says, don't say, this is the way it is. This is a scientific fact. Most good scientists will tell you there's almost no, no such thing as a scientific fact. And justify. By that I mean not just what you do, what you care about, but why. There are some things we talk about a lot. We talk about uh, religion and government a lot. Uh, but um, there are other reasons, and there are very personal reasons that you like your student activity. So tell people, tell people. It's not just something you do to be cantankerous. Then there are more often we're caught in reactive things because it's a very religious society. So first of all, listen. Now. Somebody said earlier, you don't have to put up with a fool has said in his heart there is no God. Well, no, you don't. And, and don't say, yeah, well, if a fool can figure it out. Uh, just, just, you know, say, hey, look, you know I've heard this many times and it hasn't convinced me. You have to understand that. Maybe you should tell me why it convinces you. And then when they do, listen. Ask questions. Don't wait to attack. Just make some wood people attack. You get defensive. Listen and ask questions. And care about it. It's interesting. It's very interesting what they'll tell you, if they can tell you. A lot of them can't, and we'll leave at that point. Dissent. Always dissent, but always do it politely where there's an inappropriate injection of religion, a public prayer where it shouldn't be, for example. Don't just stand around like this and don't walk out. 
take the thoughtful stance. Show that you value thinking rather than prayer. How you should do it. Agree with people as much as you can. I think uh, 30 years ago almost, I heard Dan Barker say this. So I won't, I won't steal his thunder in case he wants to say it again. But always, when, you know, yes, it is very difficult living, going through life alone. Sometimes you just need someone and no one is there. I know that. That is difficult. Don't immediately pounce and say, but you don't have to. Let them know you understand their human experience. Think small. When, look for small concessions. Well, do we have a right to be here? Do we have a right to be on campus? Don't, don't try to get them to change. Try to get them to make little concessions so that you've got a basis for working together. But finally, when all else fails, call their game. Get real. And Because this is less about religion if, if they are continually trying to convert you than it is about power. I worked with a guy, you'll think he was a Christian, he wasn't, he was a Buddhist. Every day for about a year at lunch, he just needled me about my atheism. He, every time there was some phony prayer study, he'd bring it in and we'd talk about it. And it frustrated him that I didn't take, a, take the bait. He frequently mentioned, I'm out of time, but I'm gonna finish the story. He frequently mentioned that uh, there was a, a series of exercises you could do for five minutes a day, that if an atheist did these for a year, for five minutes a day, they'd be religious. <laughs> but he'd never challenged me to do them. Finally, one day he did. Would you be open to? I love it when they, we're the ones who aren't open. And I said, Fred, you mean if I did this, for only five minutes a day, for a year. After a year, I could be more like you and less like me. <laughs> <laughs> and he, oh, I didn't mean that. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. I, that's, that's what I thought you meant. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't come to lunch for a few days. <laughs> when he did, he was very, very quiet. Finally, when there was a big, blank space. He said, Bobby, I want you to know I really respect your dedication to the truth. Finally, he got it. So, you, how do you communicate with a religionist? You just come a little closer and bend a little. Thank you.